um, let me get started. Uh, so what's this talk? Uh, I wanted to, so when, when people use Dataflow, uh, what um, they do often is they'll wonder a lot of things, right? They'll wonder, oh, in my streaming pipeline, uh, can my windows, can my older windows fire after my newer windows? Can, uh, <clears throat> uh, how can I uh, write my own window? How, um, you know, how do I decide how many parallel uh, splits are in my, in my source, right? Um, and so I wanted to talk, to try to think of all of these questions that I've heard over time and, uh, and try to put them on some slides. And so later I heard uh, that it's a good idea to try to, uh, to put these things into, to put a talk into a story. And so um, what I ended up doing is putting it in a story that is a little bit the story of how um, <clears throat> the different um, products that were built inside Google um, evolved and eventually led to to the to the current data flow runtime. Um, and yeah, so there's um, I work most of my time on Beam. Uh, I do I, I use data flow quite a bit, but I actually don't write code on 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 data flow very much. Uh, <clears throat> maybe in the last in the last four years or so, maybe like. Um, around 10 uh, code changes that I've made to Dataflow. Um, so not very much. Um, so a lot of these things will be, <laughs> they'll be, I'll try to answer as best as I can, and you you will probably have follow-up questions, and I'll try to answer those as best I can. Um, but uh, yeah, over time, I think we'll, um, uh, you should also talk to, there's several people, Googlers in, in the office, in the office, in the in attendance. So you should also try to strike conversations with them uh, if you have uh, questions about this. Um, all right then, so <clears throat> I said I structured it like a story. So this is kind of the, the quick agenda. <clears throat> so these are, you know, these first three are sort of the systems and the teams that uh, over time ended up uh, being integrated to build Dataflow. Um, and so, yeah, and at the end, I'll just give a bunch of links. Well, a list of lessons. So I'm gonna, I have a list of, I think it's 10 things to keep in mind when, when you're working with Dataflow and uh, a list of resources. So I have, a, I have a long list to, well, not that long, but uh, you know, I'll try to make it longer over time uh, of interesting blog posts, interesting uh, talks and, and the papers for this uh, for the systems, um, which were useful for me also to understand how how these systems work. Um, also, the link to these slides uh, is there, and it's, the slides are public uh, and they're open for comments. So, if you see something on this, you can use you can use them whenever. You know they'll they'll be there forever. So. If you read through them someday and you don't understand what something means or you want clarification on that, please ask a, uh, ask a question by a comment on the slides, and you know maybe we can we can uh, you know improve improve what uh, what they say. All right then, so so uh, you you almost uh, know there was uh, at some point uh, a few Googlers in, in the early two thousands got together. And they were, um, they found that they were having to write this parallel data processing jobs over and over. And they found that <clears throat> uh, they were having to write uh, certain things over and over. So things like fault tolerance, uh, parallelization, um, and then, you know, applying transforms uh, to data little by little. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, some things that you know, after re reading the paper um, and working on the team, I f I feel like there are things that I wish were at least men mentioned a little bit more on the paper. Was uh, what? How do we read data from different sources? Right? What What does it mean? Right? And in MapReduce, I guess they didn't go into it because it was um, it was they were reading log files, so they were just reading files, right? And so probably, or, uh, you know, I didn't have a chance to ask Jeff Dean, but uh, 
they were reading log files, and there's a fairly uniform set of infrastructure um, tools inside Google. So probably they didn't have to think so much about, oh, how do I design an I.O. for this system and this system and this system, right? So that and the technical details of the distributed shuffle, right? How do we take data from, from you know, this machine on the top, uh, oh, I have a clicker, uh, from this machine on the top, and how do I how do I move this data to you know the data that needs to go to the different machines on the on the right side uh, efficiently and quickly, right? Um, <clears throat> and so, in fact, uh, speak because I was speaking about this uh, um, about reading data. So when you're writing a beam pipeline and a data flow pipeline, um, it's good to remember that the parallelism of your pipeline is always defined by your source. Um, so if your source is able to provide a lot of parallelism, then you'll be able to execute a, a pipeline that has a lot of parallelism. Uh, so there's some sources, right, that are designed with this use case in mind. So, um, you know, sources like this uh, range key value stores, Bigtable, Cassandra, Dynamo, they, they have APIs that will give you ranges of keys that you can read in parallel, right? Um, Kafka pops up, they, they are designed to be consumed in parallel, so you'll have these multiple partitions. <clears throat> uh, Avro files, parquet files, they're also, they're also designed with, a, um, with an idea of having multiple blocks, right? So a single file will have multiple blocks, and you can, you can pick up the different blocks with different, you know, different workers and, and consume these files in parallel, right? Now there's other sources that we also need to read from, and they're not that easy to split. <clears throat> uh, the very common one is uh, is JDBC. Uh, so, you know, JDBC protocol doesn't have any kind of function or logic to say, oh, I, I want to give this the consumption of this data to 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 another worker. Um, so, in 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 Beam, if you've used the the JDBC sources, um, you might have noticed that. Um, you have two choices. You either consume your data in, uh, in you know, in a serial manner, or you um, you use a few tricks to um, to generate the splits before you start consuming your data. Right. Um, other other examples are compressed files. So depending on on the file compression, some file most file compressions are not designed to be able to be read in parallel, um, and uh, and some CSV. So, so common separated value files. Some of them can have <laughs> new lines within fields, and so it becomes impossible to split to split on new lines if you're just seeking through the file. Um, so I guess uh, I guess the first tip is when you're when you're defining a pipeline, it's good to be conscious of what kind of source you're you're reading, and um, again, the parallelism of your pipeline depends on your source. Now. <clears throat> What happens if you do a group by key, and you know, and what happens after that group by key? I'll I'll talk about it in a bit. Um, but anyway, so the next thing that they talked about uh, was fault tolerance, right? And so <laughs> uh, the um, so the, the the question is, the, you know, they were running this this big map reduced jobs, right? Thousands of of machines. Uh, building a, an, an index of the internet, right? And so what they found is, this is one of the things that they had to, to figure out, is there's common failures. There's just failures in disks, there's failures in network, there's, there's failures all the time. And so, especially because these are big systems, right? And so they, they implemented fault tolerance. <clears throat> and so what fault tolerance meant is this, you know, this is a little bit more applied to streaming, but it, it applies both ways. So in, in data flow and in most of these systems, when we say exactly once, we, we, <laughs> we mean, you know, something a little bit more complicated than just exactly once, right? So <clears throat> what we mean is that all elements will be successfully processed at least once. Uh, but it, you're, in your code, your code will very frequently run more than once for a single element. Um, this, um, I, and I can tell a quick anecdote of um, with some file, uh, when we are writing some files to GCS, uh, 
Um, we wanted to handle certain cases where um, a file could not was not allowed to be removed. And so we what we do is we write temporary files and then we cop we move these temporary files to uh, to a to a final destination. And so what happened is we had retries that were trying over and over to move to this final destination where these files had, you know, uh, were protected. You couldn't overwrite files because there's some, imagine it's perhaps like a, a government or like a bank that can't delete data until after a certain time, right? And so what ended up happening is that it was really easy to reproduce because there's failures happen very often. And so, so I guess my tip is, you know, your code will very often run more than once for a single element. Um, and so <clears throat> the tip is, the, so what happens is in, in, in all of these systems and in Dataflow as well, you, um, what we promise is that we will read your data and let's say that you do a group by key, we will write your data to the group by key and sometimes we'll need to run the code for this data multiple times but at the end, when you have your group by key, you will only have your data once, right? Um, now this is, yeah, I guess it's a little, um, so, you know, that's what we mean when we say exactly once. And uh, um, anyway, I added a few notes here that are meant for, for people to, to see with clarification if you ever look at the slides, you know, afterwards. Um, cool. So with MapReduce, there was also uh, an arms race of shuffle, and there were competitions to to uh, you know test how quickly people, uh, I guess, companies and teams uh, could write so systems that could shuffle as quick uh, a certain amount of data as quickly as possible, right? And this is because when you're shuffling data, you're taking data that is you know let's say that you have a hundred machines on on your cluster. Uh, you have data that is distributed in these hundred machines, and for each one of them, you need to send data to all of the other ninety-nine machines. Uh, so it's uh, it you know it becomes a a, um, a very difficult scalability problem, and so it's one of um, shuffling data is uh, can often be a bottleneck for a pipeline, right? Um, so. Um, so that's lesson number three. If uh, if you're writing logic, you know you're writing Pardus and you know applying Map, etc. Um, sometimes it's not important, but sometimes it's good to be aware that a group by key is significantly more expensive than just any uh, um, any random map operation. Um, all right, then. So continuing with the story, we had this Map Reduce being used at Google. And so what happened, and this might have happened uh, to you when you when you were working with MapReduce, uh, the open source uh, MapReduce, is people were starting to to write graphs or big workflows of of uh, MapReduce jobs, right? And so people would write a MapReduce that would do a certain transformation, and then they would orchestrate another MapReduce job that would do another transformation, and so on, right? And um, so what would happen is that each one of these jobs has, by the way, a shuffle, a group by key step. And people would uh, try to optimize sort of by hand, right? So in what in Beam you would call, uh, you know, apply map, apply Pardue, apply, et cetera. Uh, in, in MapReduce, you know, what, what users would do is they would define a class and they would, for each element, they would apply all of the transformations that they needed to do before grouping, before shuffling, before the reduce operation. Uh, and so they, it ended up being that you would have these classes that had this map function classes or these reduce function classes that were doing a lot and were a little bit hard to, to reason uh, uh, logically. And then in between each map reduce job, you would write all of your data to, to disk or to Google file system, which is what they were using at the time. Um, and like I, uh, you know, like I said, people would optimize their code by hand. And you know, inside each one of these MapReduce jobs, there would be a shuffle step. So you know, people would also have to reason, what am I doing in each job? Uh, how can I avoid doing more jobs? Because I each job you know, reads my data from disk uh, 
shuffles it and then writes it to disk again and then, you know. So anyway, um, they they came up with uh, with Flume Java was the name of the system back then. Uh, I believe the paper was written in 2013. Uh, and they they made an API that looks like this, right? So it looks a lot like Beam, uh, not a hundred percent like like Beam, but uh, it looks quite a bit like like Beam. And so, what used to you know, if, for those who have who use Beam Java a lot, is um, we used to have um, the I guess. Spark and other frameworks have something like this, right? So you'll have the representation of your collection, and then you'll say dot map, dot uh, group by key, dot, and so on, right? Um, now that's um, the reason they redesigned this is they found that the the class, the p collection class in in Flume, uh, was a huge file because they ended up having to discuss okay, which functions. Uh, should we actually add to this class and which functions do we want users to define separately, right? And so eventually they came up with, you know, I wasn't in the team yet, so uh, they came up with this idea of a P transform, right? So you would just apply P transforms and the, and the logic of, of what you're doing uh, would just be, you would just put it in your P transform and how you expand it, right? Um, so that's interesting. But anyway, so what Flume Java helped do is you know, teams could uh, could write this this series of logical operations that they were doing with with physical map reduced jobs. They were able to write them in you know in a single file, pretty much in 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 Java, and and they were able to run them. But so Flume Java was not just an orchestrator for map reduced, right? So Flume, when because once you have this sort of you're building this graph this sort of logical graph of the operations that you want to apply to your data. Uh, so then we had more information about what operations we were doing to, uh, to this data. So um, the team came up with a few optimizations. Uh, I think it was Ken, one of my coworkers recently said, they're not rocket science. They're, they're fairly simple optimizations, but uh, they help take you know, this, this set of logical you know, apply apply this uh, reformatting, apply this uh, this joining, etc., into um, into optimized execution of of, uh, of pipelines, right? So, what Beam and Dataflow and a lot of these systems will do is, you know, you will read your data, and then you might apply a series of operations to it, and um, Beam, all of these systems, in fact, do look at these operations and they figure out which of them can run together in, in memory, right? Uh, and so they figure out that everything before the group by key can run together and everything after the group by key can also run together, right? And so uh, why? Because this is just a pardo, this is just a function. So the output of this function can go directly into the input of this function. Uh, and we don't need to shuffle it, we don't need to serialize it, we don't need to change places, right? Um, and it's the same for all of this about functions. So that was the, f uh, the first optimization they wrote about. This is written on the paper, by the way. So, uh, you know, for me, the papers also have been a little bit of a way to do archaeology on, on the systems that I work because, um, you know, you, you sort of get an idea of of where where things came from and what people were thinking when they when they wrote the system. Uh, anyway, so we have another another uh, optimization that they wrote. Uh, they called it flattened syncing. So in this case, we're reading data from two different sources. Uh, we're applying uh, transformations, and then we're we're putting them together. Uh, we're writing them together to some destination. And so the optimized graph. Uh, the, the way this is executed is actually uh, as two different stages. Uh, so we'll, you know, and again, different systems do this differently. But what Dataflow ends up doing is it'll just separate the, you know, the, the left branch and the right branch and just execute them independently. Um, so this one in particular is also documented in the paper. Um, 
And they, they also did uh, one more uh, optimization, and I think this, um, this is something that is clearly visible in Beam, and it's also all of these other systems. They call it combiner lifting. So this is a word count transform. So you know, we read your, we, we need a clicker. Uh, you know, you'll read your data at the top, and then you know, you'll do whatever transformations to it. And then you'll you'll group it by word and you'll combine the words, right? You'll count how many times a word appears, right? And so if you just naively take this uh, these transformations, uh, uh, let's see, that follows. Um, yeah, wait, sorry. If you just naively take these transformations and uh, and apply them like this. Your group by key, which is where you shuffle your data, where you send it around all of the machines, uh, it will end up shuffling a copy of all of the text of the words that you're counting, right? Um, whereas what you can what you can do is um, you can. It's a little bit unclear. I copied this from the internet, but. Uh, um, you can do. You can count before you shuffle. Uh, you can you can start counting how many times each word appears on an individual machine, and instead of shuffling all of the words all of the times that they appear on the machine, you just shuffle. You know, word X appeared ten times. Word Y appeared. You know, whatever three times, right? And so they call this combiner lifting. And so, if you're doing some sort of aggregation, by the way, on your pipelines, um, it's Sometimes useful to write a combiner. Not every not every aggregation uh, uh, is uh, uh, fits a combiner pattern, but uh, but yeah. And so what ends up happening is Dataflow executes a word count pipeline as two stages. First, uh, read the data, do whatever transformation, and then do a uh, we do we call it a pre combine, and and then. We'll shuffle the data, and after the pre-combine, it'll do a, you know, a post-shuffle combination, and we'll get the final data, right? Um, so, so that's cool. Uh, wh why, uh, why do you have to think about it? Um, well, I think it's this is useful because um, sometimes when you're writing a pipeline, um, it helps to think. How the elements will go through your transforms before they get shuffled, um, and so there's an example here. This is, by the way, this is a streaming uh, transform. This is the, the when we write to BigQuery in streaming, um, we um, we take the elements right, and we BigQuery has an API where you say insert this element, right? And so, like we said earlier, there's failures all the time, and so. Um, if BigQuery receives a call from you saying insert this element and then your worker dies and you have to process that element again, then you might send a second call to BigQuery saying, oh, insert this element again. And BigQuery has no way of knowing if this second call is, it just happens to be, to be a, a new call that looks the same like the, as the previous one, or if it's actually a duplicate and it should ignore it, right? And so what BigQuery does have is um, you can provide an element identifier. Uh -huh. So you can say, OK, BigQuery, send this, this element. Uh, this person is named Pablo Estrada, and their identifier is, is one, right? And then uh, maybe it turns out that we have another Pablo Estrada in, in, in our data set. Uh, so this other Pablo Estrada will generate a new random ID for that one. Uh, and he will be number two, right? And so BigQuery, um, once we we can we can do that, then we have this this particular identifiers. BigQuery will know. Okay, this is Pablo Strata one, and this is Pablo Strata two. They're not the same person. This this belong to two rows, two separate rows, right? Um, the way we need to do that is because we might have retries. If we're generating random numbers, we might regenerate the random ID. And so the way we commit these IDs is by is we do a group by key. Um, so a group by key allows you to be sure that the that this you know group by key is the intermediate state that we guarantee will be will be will not be duplicated, 
So if you do a group by key after generating your random identifiers, then you can sort of commit these identifiers. And then you, know, you can resend them to BigQuery, and you know, your data will not be duplicated. Um, you know, a lot of the time, it's not necessary to think about this, but sometimes it's useful. Um, now, something I'll add is, you know, like I said, these optimizations are, are fairly simple. Um, there's, uh, once you know more information about the operations that are being performed, you can do more operations, you can do more optimizations. We don't do these currently, but it would be very cool to be able to say, okay, if we are mapping data in a certain way, and later we're fil filtering, we might be able to say, okay, this filter, uh, this filter is reducing how much data we're moving around, so let's do this filter earlier, you know, without the user having to think about it. Um, this is not something that we do currently, but, uh, you know, I think there's a talk by Andrew and Brian on relational data flow something and uh, uh, rela relational beam, relational beam, and uh, they go over what other optimizations uh, they would like to develop for this. All right then, so this was happening in the Flume Java team. This this team was developing, you know, this framework to do batch pipelines, right? And so the, the teams that were using them, they were, this framework is very popular in Google today as well. And uh, and so they, were, they had teams doing it and they would process their, you know, they would run their pipeline every every night or, or so on. And uh, and so in there was also a parallel work stream. <laughs> and uh, there were there were and so the <laughs> the way this happened is there were many teams that had to be build streamy uh, systems at Google. Uh, one of one of them was ads. They wanted to join, you know, when you when you do a search. Uh, you know, you have a query and you might have ads, right? If you click on one of these ads, this event will go to a different system. And so they wanted to be able to join a query to an ad click, right? And so they developed this, this other system called Photon, which was a, a domain specific system. This, this is a link to the, to the paper. It's, I found it easy to read, um, so, or easier to read. So, you know, you can take a look. Um, so there were different teams building, you know, stream processing solutions at Google, and then there was a small team in Seattle that worked on on Millwheel. And uh, now, so you might say, oh, you're saying that there was a, a separate streaming team that was not working with the Flume Java team. Uh, yeah, and in fact, uh, lesson number five is that uh, in Dataflow, the uh, the backend for batch is different than the backend for streaming. So there's a few things that work um, slightly differently in streaming. And so, in part, this is why you know uh, the Dataflow framework and and Beam itself were defined in a very generalized manner, uh, so that you know you could you wouldn't have to worry so much about execution semantics and more about you know what's the logic of your operations but again sometimes execution semantics matter and so so yes dataflow has a, a different backend in batch versus streaming um, and you might say oh you're uh, you're always so like smug and you're like saying oh you do unified batch and streaming blah blah um, the detail is um, the back the the controller the manager is the same um, so the data path is what's different and so for batch, for you know, what the MapReduce team built and the Flume team built was uh, a system to perform very large shuffle, shuffles uh, efficiently, right? So the, you would have 100 terabytes of data, a, a petabyte of data or more, and, and you would want to be able to shuffle that data, group it by key, basically, uh, and process it downstream, right? This is, this is sort of the use case that the batch people were, were tackling. The streaming people, uh, they optimize the system to perform uh, low latency exactly once shuffles, right? So you would receive an element in one of your, let's call them P-transforms, and you would want to send it as quickly as possible to the next one. Uh, 
without duplication, without dropping any data. So you have you need to have this, this same exactly once uh, data passing, uh, even though there is retries. Uh, um, and so, so yes, yeah, um, something useful to know uh, on how things run on Dataflow. When you're running in batch in Dataflow, um, bundles tend to be large. There's ten, they can be hundreds or thousands of elements. So you'll, you know, if you write a DoFun and you say, oh, do this at the beginning, do this at the end of my bundle, your DoFun might process thousands of elements uh, before calling finish bundle. Um, for batch. For streaming, uh, bundles tend to be small. And uh, <coughs> uh, in streaming, uh, bundles can be ten, less of 10 elements, some, less than 10 elements, sometimes one or two. Um, and so, and you know, when the pipeline needs to catch up, when there's a big backlog, then yes, the bundles become larger. Um, something else uh, I need to add it to the slide. In, streamings, in streaming, bundles are for a single key. So, um, when you, when you call start bundle and then do something at finish bundle and you process a bunch of elements, in streaming, all of those elements will have the same key. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and so, and I'll talk a little bit more about keys in streaming, but you might wonder, okay, if that's nice, but sometimes I need my bundles to, you know, not vary so much. Uh, so how can I control my bundle size? My advice is this transform group into batches. Um, it's, uh, it has um, logic to um, group, group your data into batches and do, it works for batch and streaming. Uh, you, can, you can say how big you want your batches to be and for streaming you can set a timeout. So, you know, if you, if you want your batches to be a little bigger but you don't, you don't, wanna, uh, you don't wanna wait a lot of time for the data to accumulate, then you can also set a timeout. And there is, uh, I was preparing this <laughs> slides yesterday, so I didn't have time to add a lot of information, but we have a, an auto sharding feature uh, in streaming, which uh, I think I shared a blog post. And if not, I don't have the blog post here, but I'll add it uh, today so that if you look at the slides, you can see what it is. All right then, so, um, Oh yeah, and there's there's this link, a very good talk given by Ruben, so one of the authors, uh, on what were the things that they learned uh, when they were doing uh, Millwheel, which was the streaming system, the first implementation of the streaming system. Uh, one of the things he talks about is the watermarks. How did they figure out how to define a watermark? They they he mentions that they tried to do some statistical models. <laughs> he says that back then. It was just linear regression, uh, but uh, but that end, that ended up not working. And um, you know, he talks about how they ended up defining the watermarks. Anyway, this team they wrote a paper. Paper is this mill wheel, fault tolerant, blah blah blah. Anyway, and this paper has kind of all of the basic building blocks of the streaming system. So they talk about watermarks, which is you know how you know up to what point you've received data. They talk about timers, which is you know how we, um, you know, we use timers a lot for for windowing and triggering, right? They talk about state, so you're processing, you know, over time, but you want to be able to remember some things that happened in the past, so that you can do aggregations on your data set or whatever. Uh, and so, and you know, something very important is in in mill wheel, everything is processed per key. Um, so, what does that mean? That uh, okay, lesson six, yes. In data flow, in streaming, uh, every single element belongs to a key. So you might not know it. You might have, you might be using a, a you might be using an element that is not a key value pair. Uh, but in the backend, the backend is associating your element to a key. And the key is, uh, let's say that it's, it's, it can be a random key. In, let's say when you're reading from Kafka, you have a topic and you have partitions, right? So each partition will produce elements on a single key. Um, again, you don't, you don't see the keys, you just see a Kafka record. Uh, but in the backend, um, this, uh, this key is, this, uh, the elements coming from this individual partition, they are being processed as if they had the same key. Um, 
and, and I'll, I'll mention in a bit why that's interesting. Uh, lesson seven uh, that, I, that I found is, uh, in streaming, everything is timers, uh, state, and watermarks. So uh, trigger semantics that are sometimes tricky. You know, you're writing your trigger, and you're like, oh, I'm not sure what this means exactly. Um, triggers are implemented with timers. And so there's a very good blog post uh, uh, by, by Ken, who is not here, but he is around, uh, on how, how, do, how to do timer-based processing in Beam. Um, I recommend you take a look because timers are the base of how triggers work. And so if you, if you can see uh, more or less how we, how we use timers, how they work, et cetera, then it'll be a little easier to wrap your head around what triggers are doing. And, uh, and state is how we make windows work, um, right? We'll receive elements for a given window, we'll, we'll buffer it in state, and then uh, if the, you know, once the watermark passes, which is once the timer for that uh, event time passes, then we can output that window, for example, right? All right then, so what did Millwill look like? Um, you would define a, a topology and uh, where you have operations. And for each operation, you would define uh, this, uh, you would override this class in C++. Uh, and so you would, you would uh, define all of these calls, you would define a process record call, which is uh, basically like process in, in Beam. Uh, you would define a process timer call, which is how, you know, the calls that, very similar to the calls that we have on timer fire. Um, and then you would, you would have accessors to, you know, how to set a timer and how to output a record to a, to a specific stream, right? And so this is, I am not sure, but I think this interface is very used still at Google. Uh, there's a, Millwheel was fairly popular inside Google. Um, and so what happened is the, um, the, yeah, the team, I think they worked with specific teams in Google and they, you know, they improved the system over time and they improved the watermark semantics and so on. So, all right. So why is it interesting that everything in streaming data flow is associated to a key, uh, is that processing is serial for each key. Um, so. Uh, for both batch and streaming, if you, um, if especially if you do a group by key, downstream uh, elements of a single key cannot be processed in two threads. Elements of a single key will always be arrive be processed by the same thread. Um, it could be that um, many systems could do this. They move the processing of the data to a different worker but the processing of a single key will not happen in parallel. It might, we might be processing a key and we might decide, okay, uh, we need to move this key to a different worker. So then we'll stop processing this key, move it to a different worker and continue processing there. Um, but yeah, so if you're reading from, let's say Kafka, from Kafka partitions, you're applying transformations to it. And let's say maybe you do, you do a reshuffle uh, well, in, uh, if you don't change the keys when you do this reshuffle, you'll still see uh, processing that is serial for, for each key. So you'll see the elements of the partitions in Kafka appear in the, uh, for, in, the, in the same order as they were consumed from Kafka. Oh, and you might say, oh, you're, <laughs> you're also so smug about key collections, ordering, and so on. Um, um, oh, sorry before I say that. So this also means that the number of keys in your pipeline is the maximum parallelism. Um, so if you have five keys in your pipeline, you can only process on five threads at any, at any given time. Um, so, you know, it's, it's usually good to have more than uh, a few keys. Um, and yes, so another lesson that comes from that is that in streaming, uh, it's, they call it key to key order is guaranteed. Um, so, <laughs> and then that's where you might say, oh, but you're always so like hand wavy about, oh, big collections, they're not ordered or, but, um, and again, this is only for streaming. 
Um, but so we have this example, right? Let's say that you're you're reading from Kafka, you're whatever applying a window where you just fire every element after your group by key, and you have these elements, right? In your Kafka partition, you know Kafka also guarantees order for the same publisher, right? If you're if you publish message one, then publish message two, then publish message three, uh, Kafka tells you that the consumers will also see them in that order, right? And so let's say that we're consuming this partition in this order, and then we just do a group by key, and then we, we print the elements. Uh, what you will see when running this in Dataflow is you will see the elements of each user be you know, processed in the same order that they were output, um, which is, which, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter, and sometimes it matters a lot. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, all right, then. Uh, this is on streaming only, not in batch. And there's some notes clarifying. But in batch, when we do a group by key, what we do is we take the whole data set and we sort it. We sort it by key uh, in a dist big distributed sort. And so, we, we can't guarantee that the, the output will be observed downstream in the same order as it was received into the group by key. Um, so that's cool. Uh, another note uh, in this, so this was, uh, I'll, I'll try to say this quickly, but this was, um, I started talking to people in the, in the Beam team and in the streaming backend team, and I was like, hey, I want to, tell people that we, we guarantee this sort of ordering. And the people in the Beam team were like, OK, you should go check with the streaming team people, because I don't know if they, they would like that. And the streaming people told me, oh, I don't know. You should check with the Beam team, because I don't know if they would like that. And so, so it, turned out, it turned out that you know, we, were, we were supporting this all along. We just, we just you know, didn't kind of dare to, to create the constraint, the expectation of the constraint uh, for users, right? So. Anyway, um, another because uh, because data flow processes keys in order, state and timers are per key. By the way, uh, in fact, in Beam, uh, the state and timers are. Uh, we'll we'll look about that. But anyway, um, data flow processes timers for each key in order, and that also means that your your triggers and your windows will fire in order. Um, um, there's a speaker here who asked this question a few weeks ago, uh, and and uh, my my colleague told her that they don't fire in order, and then I checked and they do, and uh, so anyway, um, so there's there's a very good in-depth blog about this about how the the current streaming backend works um, by Slava, one of the authors as well, so you should check it out. All right then, so I'm running out of time, but uh, um, eventually these two teams, they, they started talking to each other and, and they thought, okay, how do we support streaming flows on, on Flume, right? And so I spoke to one of the people who worked on this particular integration and what he says, you know, is, you know, Windows were the key inside, right? So we wanted to unify them uh, in a way we had in both of them, we had some kind of grouping by key, some kind of processing by key. Um, but, uh, you know, in Millwheel, there wasn't a group by key operation. And if you were just to apply a group by key, you would just get, you know, all of the elements that are streaming in that key, right? They ended up coming up with, with these windows. Uh, so the first thing they defined were windows. And later they thought, oh, well, we have also watermarks, so we need to think about triggers, right? And so, they, the way they unified it is in this group by key with Windows. And so what happened is when they implemented the first Flume streaming API, they didn't have state and timers. State and timers were gone. We only had Windows and triggers. Um, and state and timers were a detail of the underlying implementation. Um, uh, what, what ended up happening later is that state and timers are are very powerful. Um, I, re I really, I really like you know this post that I recommended earlier. Um, you can implement any sort of logic with state and timers. It's a little easier to reason, for instance, about sessions, especially if you have a session opening event, session closing event. It's probably easier to implement that as 
with state and timers than with a session window. Um, so, you know, Ken, who is also in attendance, but not here, he added an API to support state and timers. And they were redesigned slightly to work per window um, because in Beam, we always have a window active and in the underlying system, don't quote me on this, but I think we don't have a notion of windows. We just, we're just storing state. So, but don't quote me on that one. Uh, uh, all right. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out of time. But uh, so um, we, um, so what does this data flow service look like? You know, we had, you know, we had these workers um, that would be talking to a backend. And in each worker, we would have, um, you know, we had a Java worker, a Python worker. They would speak the Dataflow API to Dataflow, and uh, we had some bindings for 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 a batch shuffle and for a streaming shuffle. Um, and so these this you know the workers would talk to each other to shuffle batch data. Uh, same for streaming. Um, and so what happened is, you know. Going back a little bit, we had these workers talking Dataflow API, and we thought, okay, we, we're building Beam. What do we um, do? We have to build a worker, a Python worker that speaks Flink API, a Python worker that uh, speaks Spark API, uh, a Java worker that speaks Flink, a Java worker that speaks Spark, and so on. And so this is where they came up with uh, with this um, portability framework, which is something that. Beam has been talking about for a long time. And so the way Dataflow does this now is we what talk what speaks the Dataflow API is a is a C thing. And uh, and then the SDK worker, which is part of Beam 100 percent speaks Beam API to the Dataflow harness. And this this all runs inside a GC VM, by the way. Um, there's a really good talk here about, uh, yeah, portability framework. Um, this is all going to be uh, available. Anyway, and we also what we also did, uh, what we also did is we moved the shuffling uh, on the VMs. We moved it to be a service, uh, which you might have heard about. There's shuffle service and there's streaming engine. So these are both. Uh, we have big arrows because these are the data paths. So we have all of the big chunk of data. Uh, Going back to a Google managed backend and uh, and being shuffled there, right? And we're doing batch shuffles on one, and we're doing streaming shuffles on the other one, um, which are a little different. Is there more latency because now the shuffling is not running in the VM? Yes, there's more latency, but uh, it's not the only trade-off. Uh, and I I don't know this code well enough, so I'm. Uh, but yeah, so we for us. Uh, we're 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 trying to standardize uh, to to just do the shuffling on the backends. And something cool is the shuffling on the backends can be super large scale. Uh, it's, we can do very very large shuffles. Uh, Rick spoke about this the biggest data flow job, and so yeah, the biggest data flow job had been a huge Spotify wrapped job that shuffled a whole bunch of data. I don't know how much, and um, but I think it costs a lot of money, and so they they optimize how they do their shuffles, and they're going to talk about it on Wednesday. Um, anyway, so the summary: these are the lessons. Uh, you can again check out the slides whenever. Uh, and here are some of the resources. <laughs> so yeah, here are the links. If there's links that are missing, or if you have more questions, you can ask me now, or you can you can put comments on the slides. Uh, my my conclusion: Yes, data flow is uh, uh, complex, but yeah, sometimes you know we leak implementation details, and it's important to know them. So yeah, um, and yeah, if you have questions, again, we can chat. You can ask on on Stack Overflow. We the team monitors Stack Overflow, and there's several people from the team around. So you know, chat. <laughs>